Hello everyone, my name is Rani and I'm an exercise science graduate from Rutgers University. I am thrilled to introduce our next speaker for today, Dr. Crystal. Dr. Crystal is the Robert L. McNeil Junior Professor of Translational Research, Professor of Psychiatry, Neuroscience and Psychology, and Chair of the Department of Psychiatry at Yale University. He has published extensively on the neurobiology and treatment of schizophrenia, alcoholism, PTSD, and depression. Notably, his laboratory discovered the rapid antidepressant effects of ketamine in humans. Dr. Crystal is a member of the US National Academy of Medicine and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Today, he will be presenting on the topic of psychiatry as a career. So let us welcome Dr. Crystal. Good morning, Good morning everybody. Um, but I'm going to share, see if you can see my slides. All right. Hopefully everybody can see, uh, see my slides. Um, and I'll be talking to you about psychiatry as a career. Um, what I thought I would do is begin by talking about what psychiatry is like as a profession. Then I'll talk a little bit about my path about psychiatry and a little, and where I've come in my thinking about a career in psychiatry. So what is psychiatry? Psychiatry is an area of medicine. And when I say it's an area of medicine, I mean that people who practice psychiatry graduate after four years of college, then they complete four years of medical school, and then they complete four years of training in psychiatry and then if they want to specialize in a sub area of psychiatry like forensic psychiatry, geriatric psychiatry, addiction psychiatry, psychosomatic medicine, or other areas, then they have to do a fellowship period after psychiatry residency, usually of one or at most two years. Psychiatry focuses collectively on the leading causes of disability worldwide. These are the disorders of emotion, like depression, cognition, like schizophrenia or dementia, or social function, uh, problems like um, uh, antisocial personality disorder, psychopathy, uh, or autism. Um, and there are basically two main, two domains of illness. First, we focus on the treatment of psychiatric disorders like depression and schizophrenia and autism. And we also focus on the neural, emotional, cognitive, and social impact of every medical disorder, a person's reaction to cancer, a person's reaction to heart disease, a person's reaction to diabetes. And so we work in nearly every area of medicine. It's the area of medicine that places a major emphasis on the patients of ex experience of themselves in the world. Um, and among all areas of medicine, psychiatry is the area that uses psychotherapy uh, as a mode of treatment. Among the mental health specialties, in other words, social work, psychology, uh, psychiatric nursing, uh, et cetera, it's the only mental health specialty to deal with the entire context of mental illness, the medical part of it, the psychological part of it, and the social part of it. And in this way, psychiatry deals at, with an extraordinarily broad range of conceptual domains. You might say from molecules to, to society. And because we work in so many different ways, in so many different contexts, targeting so many different kinds of information, there's enormous freedom in people who pursue psychiatry to pursue different parts of the field at different phases of their career and to change directions uh, if they wish to do so over the course of their career. So as I mentioned, psychiatrists uniquely integrate brain behavior and social functions. And in our clinical work, everything we do stems from our relationship with our patients, our understanding of the biomedical, psychological, social, uh, and uh, 
uh, social determinants, meaning things like being homeless, uh, being poor, uh, uh, being exposed to terrible things in, in one's life. So in thinking about patients and drawing on the science, we're thinking about the genetic causes and basic biological mechanisms of illness, basic brain functions. We're interested in how the circuits of the brain that, that support behavior are altered in the context of psychiatric disorders. We're thinking about how to use ways to change the brain directly through the prescription of medications and through the application of brain stimulation techniques to change the activity of brain circuits and thereby alleviate symptoms and suffering. And we're thinking about how to use psychotherapy, our discussions with individuals, with their families, and with groups of people to try to um, help them in, in their recovery. And we also try to attend to and support community-based interventions uh, and the practical issues like housing, disability pensions, and other factors uh, shaping uh, social determinants of, of their health. So we deal with very broad areas. Now, when you think about the equipment of psychiatry, um, you might say old school, that basically a lot of what we do in psychiatry, um, perhaps up until COVID, involved notepads, pens, and comfy chairs to have good discussions. But the field actually is incorporating a variety of new kinds of technologies to help, <clears throat> help us to better understand the brain, to help us um, better assess patients, and to help us to uh, better treat patients. And some of these tech new technologies are brain imaging techniques like MRI, positron emission tomography, EEG, magnetoencephalography. And some of these brain stimulation techniques are, include electroconvulsive therapy, transcranial direct current stimulation, and transcranial magnetic stimulation. So I mentioned that psychiatry, uh, you, in psychiatry, you can have many different kinds of careers. Now, many people are most familiar with the notion of psychiatrists working in an office treating patients with medications and psychotherapy. In other words, the private practice model of psychiatry. However, there are all kinds of settings in which psychiatrists work, inside hospitals, in inpatient psychiatry units, working in hospitals and clinics where we're consulting to medical and surgical patients, working with the courts and the prisons in an area we call forensic psychiatry, advising governments, providing outpatient care, educating the public, working with the pharmaceutical and biotechnology industry to develop new treatments, conducting research in academic medical centers, teaching. We, we do a lot of different kinds of things in psychiatry. So why do people like pursuing careers in psychiatry? First, the work is incredibly interesting and very rewarding. I would say it pays well enough. It's uh, uh, sort of in the middle of uh, medical specialties. Cer certainly certain kinds of doctors like surgeons make, make more money. Uh, others, I suppose, make less. As a work a a lifestyle, it's a good lifestyle. You, people have a lot of ability to control the hours that they work and the kind of patients and kind of context that they work with. There are many different kinds of career paths. There are pop, but there's the potential for flexible scheduling for parents. And there are some challenges in psychiatry. First off, it's the area of medicine where's, where there's probably the greatest shortage of doctors. So there are often many, many more people uh, if you're a doctor in private practice, many, many more people seeking your help that you can treat. Oftentimes, working in hospital and clinic settings, the services that you can offer may be determined or shaped uh, largely by reimbursement that patients get rather than by what they need. Um, and so there's a paradox, which is that 
Um, while uh, psychiatric problems of, often lead people to uh, be out of work or to be disabled, that paradoxically, psychiatrists, many of them in private practice, uh, are treating uh, a group of people that are sometimes called the worried well. In other words, people who have all the resources and can pay out of pocket instead of uh, using their insurance or their um, public uh, disability payments. Some people find uh, that doing the work of psychiatry is very emotionally demanding. Clearly, in psychiatry, when we're doing psychotherapy and interacting with our patients, that there can be, uh, a, uh, you're dealing with people at very difficult periods in their lives, and that we're dealing with people on very difficult issues, uh, emotional distress, family difficulties, and, and some of our patients um, of, uh, in a long career of uh, long career in psychiatry, some of your patients will eventually uh, commit suicide, and that's obviously can be very upsetting. But I would say overall, it's a very rewarding career, and and most of the time you're dealing with helping people to make positive change in their lives. So what can you do in college to prepare for psychiatry? You need to take the pre med pre-medical uh, school requirements like uh, anyone going to medical school to become a surgeon or, or a, 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 a in internist. It's good to learn about psychology and you can do that by taking classes in psychology in college. You can read books about psychiatry and you can get experience in the field of psychiatry or psychology by getting involved in research at a medical school or academic medical center, or more locally for some people to shadow a psychiatrist in a hospital or a clinic based. If there aren't psychiatrists in your area, psychiatric nurse practitioners or psychologists would also be good people to schedule to try to get a feel of the field. I hope you'll take the idea of a, a career in psychiatry in, uh, to heart because we need more psychiatrists and we particularly need more young psychiatrists who bring new perspectives into the field. And, and so I hope you'll think about that. Um, so I'm gonna switch now to talk a little bit about my path in psychiatry. This is a picture of me uh, when I was uh, a senior in college um, and I was uh, at a meeting, the American Psychiatric Association meeting where I had the good fortune to actually join my father, who was a, a psychiatrist as well, uh, in, in a session in the setting. And when I think about two uh, influences, uh, uh, when I was in high school uh, and early in college, who had a big impact, one was my father, this who was a psychiatrist, uh, who from whom I learned a lot about about ways of thinking about careers in psychiatry. And, and the other person who probably had a big influence on me before I got into college was uh, Miles Davis, who was a famous uh, jazz trumpet player. I, I uh, was very involved in music um, in high school and, and my, I tried to play trumpet in the style of Miles Davis, although of course I failed in, <laughs> in, in uh, achieving anything like the accomplishment uh, that, that Miles Davis had. But my involvement in music got me very interested in the problems of addiction because some of the people uh, that I was in bands with in high school and college developed addiction problems. Um, and so when I started out in college, I looked uh, to uh, try to get some exposure in the way that I, I mentioned. And I, and I started volunteering at a methadone clinic and I got involved in an academic program in a methadone clinic that was connected to my college. Um, and when I was in, um, when I was in college, I learned that, um, that there were chemicals in the brain um, called endorphins that acted just like methadone and bound to the receptors for uh, these uh, opiates like morphine or methadone called opiate receptors. 
and that there were whole chemical systems of the brain, therefore, that were responsible for the development of physical dependence on opiates. And for me, there was, uh, I, it was like a moment of epiphany. Uh, I had a, this insight that the thing that most fascinated me about the work was the connection between the very basic level of, uh, of uh, neuroscience and brain science and the problems that patients that I saw in the clinic, methadone clinics were having. And this process of linking basic neuroscience to the clinical practice of psychiatry is called translational neuroscience. And I developed that passion uh, in, in college and that has been in some ways the main organizing uh, principle for my career. When I graduated from college, I came to Yale for medical school. And the reason that I came to Yale for medical school was it seemed to be a good home for somebody who had the kinds of interests that I had, that is connecting the very basic levels of neuroscience to clinical practice. And the reason that, that what they had done that made it seem like a good place was to develop a, the first non-opiate treatment for opiate withdrawal, which was called clonidine. And the idea that they developed, discovered at Yale, was that nerve cells in the brain uh, possess both receptors, the opiate receptors, and a, another receptor called the alpha-2 noradrenergic receptor, which is a receptor stimulated by clonidine. So that in opiate-dependent tissues, if you stop taking methadone or heroin or morphine, the neuron would get very activated and you could suppress that activity by giving clonidine. Clonidine was then shown to suppress withdrawal symptoms in animals and to suppress withdrawal symptoms in people. And this was the first time in the entire history of psychiatry where somebody had worked out a very basic neuroscience mechanism and taken it all the way to a new treatment. So I, I figured this would be a good place for me to go because I wanted to do something like that. In some ways, and this is me in, in, in medical school, my friends and I did a lot of rock climbing. And, and so part of me was looking for adventure outside of the medical school classroom. But a lot of what I was also doing was looking for adventure in my science. I was looking to find areas that we didn't understand, and to see whether by exploring those areas that we didn't understand well, whether we could come up with new treatments for psychiatric disorders. After finishing my psychiatry residency, um, I joined the faculty. And I had never done schizophrenia work before, but when I joined the faculty, um, I decided to work in the area of schizophrenia for a while. And it went something like this. My boss said, do you want to be the director of the schizophrenia unit or the de director, deputy director of the PTSD unit, which was an area that I also was very interested in. And I said, I, I'll take schizophrenia. I don't know if it was a smart decision, but I thought I wanted to be in charge and in order to be in charge, I had to study schizophrenia. And that, in a nutshell, is how I got involved in schizophrenia. But as I started learning more and more about schizophrenia, I realized that I wanted to figure out how I could have a kind of distinctive impact through my science. And I'll, I'll call that, for the purposes of, of, of our discussion, a hook. And the hook was that at the time, most of the field of schizophrenia focused on a chemical system called dopamine. And the dopamine cells live in a primitive part of the, mid, uh, of the brain called the midbrain and, and tune the activity of higher brain centers, the cortex and the basal ganglia. It seemed to me that, that the pathology of schizophrenia did not live in the primitive centers of the brain, but lived in the highest centers of the brain. And because they lived in the cortex and the limb and the basal ganglia and limbic system, that meant that they that the biology of schizophrenia involved a different 
uh, chemistry, not the sim simple chemistry of the dopamine cells, but the, the chemistry of glutamate releasing cells. Glutamate is the main excitatory transmitter in the cortex. And I decided that I would shift the entire direction of my work to focus on the glutamate system. And that brought me to a drug that I could use to give to people to test the integrity of the glutamate system, the brain. That um, drug was an uh, anesthetic medication called ketamine, um, which is also a drug of abuse. And the remarkable thing that we found when we administered ketamine to healthy people in very low doses that didn't make them go to sleep like surgery was that it, this drug transiently, briefly produced symptoms that resembled the entire spectrum of symptoms that we would associate with schizophrenia. The, the positive or psychosis-like symptoms, things like hallucinations and delusions, but also the negative symptoms, the emotional blunting, the detachment, the, the uh, lack of experience to, uh, lack of experience of pleasure, as well as cognitive impairments that were uh, disabling. Um, all of these uh, effects produced by uh, ketamine um, resembled in some ways what one would see in schizophrenia. To make my career a very, a very um, uh, long story short, what we did then over the next 30 years were to find the best technologies that we could use, the best techniques that we could use, and the best teams of collaborators that we could build in order to ask the question, why does this simple drug, ketamine, produce effects in the brain that result in behaviors that look like schizophrenia? And here's one example of what we found out. Our, my colleague, uh, Amy Arnston, found that a, a drug very much like ketamine um, could affect uh, single units in the brains of non-human primates involved in a cognitive function that's impaired in schizophrenia called working memory. When it, and a monkey tries to keep information online, it activates certain neurons in the prefrontal cortex, and those neurons stay active as long as the information is kept online, and then they got those neurons guide action and go offline. If you block the glutamate receptor, you prevent this activation. Now we're not recording uh, the activity of single units, single neurons in the brain with electrodes in healthy people. We're using functional magnetic resonance imaging to show that these populations of nerve cells are activated during the encoding of working memory. And, and then um, the activity goes away after they act based on that memory. The NMDA glutamate receptor blocker ketamine reduces this activation, contributing to cognitive impairments like impairments in working memory. And this is relevant to schizophrenia because while healthy people activate this part of the prefrontal cortex worth working memory, people with schizophrenia show um, reduced activity as if they had gotten ketamine. But no, they're not getting any ketamine. This is their intrinsic biology. And then we can use high level computational neuroscience, mathematical modeling to identify certain weak points in the circuitry that might account for why we see these, these patterns of neural activity. And, and we've made these bridges which help us to understand why the, pharmaco the drug effects resemble the symptoms of the disorder. And what that has led to is new insights into the neurobiology of schizophrenia, focusing on disturbances in the activity of certain very micro circuits in the prefrontal cortex. This has enabled us to incorporate information from many different uh, areas of research, such as molecular genetics, which help us to understand why these abnormalities in circuits develop in schizophrenia that resemble the effects of ketamine. It has led us to test uh, potential new treatments um, for schizophrenia 
that we wouldn't have otherwise thought about testing because we are trying to ameliorate or prevent the circuit dysfunction that ketamine produces. I should say that that use of ketamine, which as I mentioned, is an anesthetic medication, but also a drug of abuse, um, that it turned out to not be popular with a lot of people that we were studying the effects of ketamine with people. Some people thought that it was risky to give a drug to people that briefly produced symptoms of dissociation or psychosis. Um, and several uh, advocacy groups were concerned about this. And that led to newspaper articles raising concerns about the safety of ketamine in research. Those articles appeared in, in, in important places like the New York Times and the Boston Globe. In response to the concern, Yale instituted several levels of review. They reviewed my research, they reviewed my documentation, they reviewed um, uh, that, uh, and other institutions uh, uh, um, uh, reviewed people who were um, uh, uh, doing ketamine research at other institutions. And the main funding agency for a while did not uh, fund uh, research on giving, uh, people giving ketamine to uh, test its effects. And ultimately, Yale asked the director of the National Institute of Mental Health to come and review all of my research. Um, and the upshot, though, was that my research program was uh, very strongly endorsed, and I was able to continue my research. And that ended up being a good thing because the next thing we tested were the, was the antidepressant eff effects of ketamine. And that led to the identifi identification of ketamine and a, a new drug called esketamine as the first rapid acting antidepressant. Let me say a little bit about depression, because many of you may think that, that depression is like, like having a bad day um, and that not many people really struggle with it. But the reality is it's a very common problem um, at any given time, uh, around a little less than 10% will meet formal diagnostic criteria. 10% of the population, one in 10 people will be depressed. So there are a hundred some odd people on the call that would suggest that in their lifetimes, maybe up to 10 of us or more will have depression. Depression is one of the leading causes of disability in the United States and worldwide. It's also, as I mentioned earlier, a lethal disorder in that some people uh, will commit suicide, but also because depression is part of, a, of, of changes in your entire body, uh, including a process called inflammation that can contribute to heart disease, uh, lung disease, um, uh, other diseases, that if you have an index of depression, episode of depression, and particularly if that episode of depression is not treated, that, that it can shorten the length of one's life. The other reason that I wanted to get involved in depression because antidepressants, the standard antidepressants um, uh, are, were less, turned out to be less effective than we hoped. That in general, between one in two and one in three people treated with an antidepressant will respond. Um, and at the end, uh, typically about a third of people will not respond to the standard medications. And when they respond, if you're one of the people who respond, it can take a few months to respond. And if you um, are one of the people who doesn't respond very well to medications and you ultimately get to a response, there's a good chance you'll relapse. So there, were, there was a need for medications that were both more effective, that worked more rapidly and helped to prevent relapse. And the conceptual leap was to view um, depression from the same perspective that we brought to uh, schizophrenia. Um, that in the case of depression, we were focused on other symptom systems in the brain in depression, the serotonin and norepinephrine system, but we were brought back to thinking of depression as a disorder of the cortex and limbic system rather than the primitive parts of the brain. 
and, the, and our thinking led us back to glutamate as a neurotransmitter and led to us uh, testing ketamine effects in depression. So remember that I said that, that the average antidepressant can take about two months to really kick in. What we found when we gave a single dose of ketamine to patients with depression was that within about four hours, people were feeling a little bit better and some patients within 24 to 48 hours were all better. In other words, that their depression had completely gone away. This was a completely shocking uh, observation to us and uh, ultimately to the field, but it, um, it helped us to appreciate that by targeting, going in new directions, uh, targeting new aspects of the biology that we might identify treatments that had been both unexpected and which were um, uh, effective in ways that we couldn't have anticipated. Now, Time Magazine has called ketamine the anti-antidepressant. And I think that's really in some ways an apt um, idea because first of all, because it was so unexpected. And second of all, because it has led us to think about really new and exciting aspects of the biology of depression. And to, to boil this down in, in very simple ways, um, one idea is that the glutamate system itself is abnormal in depression in two fundamental ways. The first, which um, we could test with a technology called carbon-13 magnetic resonance spectroscopy, is that ketamine, I mean, that glutamate synaptic connections in the brain are less effective. So that instead of uh, when, a, molecule of glutamate binds to the glutamate receptor instead of evoking a big response, it evolves, it evokes a small response. In other words, the neural communication is less efficient. Another and equally kind of striking finding was that we were able to identify using a different technology called positron emission tomography, was that not only were the synapses less effective, but there were fewer of them. In other words, that there was a reduction in the density of glutamate synapses in the brains of people with, who were experiencing depression. And you could show in animals that these synaptic connections, these arrows marked here by the arrows, are reduced in animals that are stressed, and that a single dose of ketamine in a stressed animal will cause the synaptic connections to regrow. So you're not only effect, affecting the functionality of brain circuits, but the illnesses are affecting the structure of these brain circuits and the treatments are similarly restoring or normalizing brain structure. Um, I'm gonna skip through this slide relatively quickly because I think in the end, I'm just gonna make one other point here, which is that there are other treatments that may target the regrowing of dendritic spines. And one of them, which works in a different way, is called psilocybin, which is a hallucinogenic drug. Um, but it also um, has the potential to activate brain circuits and to regrow these uh, synaptic connections. This is just results from a study that was recently published by another group suggesting that psilocybin may also have antidepressant effects. So in closing, there are, I'd like just to share some big picture thoughts about psychiatry and a career. First, find your passion, whatever that is, and pursue it. Choose a good home to, to, um, to pursue that, a place where people um, will support your interests. Find your adventure. Everything that, that you do should be exciting and fun and, and help you to connect, stay connected to your passion. Um, think about what's your angle on this? What's your hook? What is the problem that really reaches out and grabs you? And, and how could you get involved in a way that feels important and meaningful to you? If you're lucky enough to find that, take the leap. Just get involved, get started somewhere. It, whether it turns out to be the right path or not, doesn't matter, it will sort out. 
and and um, over the long haul of your career, um, pursue the things that seem important to you, whatever they are, and stick to your guns. Because in every career, there are going to be moments that are very challenging, where you face unexpected obstacles or disappointments, um, like when we um, were uh, had to deal with the concerns about the safety of Academy. Um, but if you stick to your guns and stay open to new adventures, you may just find things that you don't expect, like the antidepressant effects Academy. I've told you this story as if it was a story about me or just about me, but it's really about teams, about people who've worked together. And, and these are all people who were involved in the research or helping me uh, to figure out a path that I wanted to go in my career. And I'm incredibly grateful to these people, including our, our patients, um, our families, uh, and, and the context that we worked in. I just wanted to say one thing about academic psychiatry, which is a, particularly pa a particular passion of mine, which gives you all kinds of great opportunities like interacting with remarkable colleagues, traveling the world, collaborating with people around the world, um, editing journals, advising organizations and governments, leading professional societies and, and um, things. And I'd like to make one other point which is useful just to store away, which is at, at your stage of, of your career, you will find that your career is all about you. Who am I? What do I like? What do I want to do? What should I do? How should I go there? How, should, how can I make connections? And what happens over a career is that it shifts to being not so much about you, but about the picture, bigger picture around you creating a legacy in your field, fostering the careers of young people, building organizations and helping society. So um, what doesn't change is this excitement of discovery, the quest for deeper understanding, the meaningfulness of work with patients, the stimulation of challenging yourself and trying to learn new things, the pleasure of teamwork and the thrill of discovery. So, with that, I'm going to stop my screen share and, and maybe we can um, take some questions. All right. Thank you so much for all your wonderful insights and the lessons you shared with us, Dr. Crystal. So we will now take a leap into our Q&A session. And attendees, please feel free to use the raise hand feature if you would like to ask the questions live. So let's go ahead and see our first question, which is, what is the difference between psychiatry and psychology? Okay, that's a great question. In, so psychologists go to college, um, you often, but not always uh, major in psychology and apply to PhD programs, graduate school programs in psychology. So uh, a psychologist is a PhD, not a medical doctor, but often very well trained in both research approaches and in psychotherapeutic techniques. And um, an, a psychiatrist is an MD doctor, in other words, can practice medicine, prescribe medications, um, and does additional specialization in, in psychiatry and can prescribe medications, but uh, doesn't may not have the same uh, training that the the psychologist has, particularly in research methods, unless they pursue that. Awesome, thank you for clarifying that, Dr. Crystal. Our next question would be, would you recommend someone joining the psychiatric field if they have a, had a history of mental illness? Um, if, they, if they have had a history of mental illness. So the, the, way, that I the way that I look about it is it's very similar to asking, if it would be appropriate to enter the field of orthopedic surgery if you broke your leg. In other words, a history of mental illness, as long as that mental illness is well treated and managed and, and you're okay and able to do what you need to do, then I think it's fine for people who have a history of mental illness to pursue 
um, uh, 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 psychiatry. You know, about, it's about one in five, one in three families have someone in them with mental illness. If we ruled out people who came from families with mental illness, we'd rule out almost everybody in the country. So we can't afford to do that. We need people who either have personal or family experience with mental illness um, to uh, some, some of them anyway, to go into psychiatry. And, um, and sometimes those people bring unique insights that are helpful. Awesome. So what are some habits or mindsets that have empowered you in your psychi psychiatry journey? So um, I, I think the one that, um, that I would say for, first and foremost, and I tried to allude to it um, with the picture of me rock climbing, is that I love adventures and I love challenges. I love diving into things that are mysterious to me and learning about them. And, um, and uh, so I, I find my career, I've been doing this for, on the faculty for 40 years. I continue to be excited about coming to work every day to try to, to, um, to, uh, to do this work. The second thing I would say is that I find, I find the problems that people are struggling with depression, anxiety, psychosis, cognitive impairments. I find those to be incredibly uh, meaningful problems. And so I like to talk to people to hear about what their problems are, about their painful emotions, their difficult experiences, because when I can help them manage those situations, I feel like I've done something very important for them. I think this is one of the things that I learned from my father which is that sometimes it's more important to focus on things you can do to help someone feel better about themselves and their lives than to say, just extend their lives. If the, you know, that the quality of life is really important and psychiatrists do a lot to help people with the quality of their lives. All right, and for our next one is, how does psychiatry differ from behavioral neuroscience? Well, psychiatrists and neurologists are the main types of doctors that work in behavioral neuroscience. So um, there's a, there's a sub-area of, of neurology um, called behavioral neurology, and there's a, a sub-area of psychiatry and, and, um, that's called neuropsychiatry. And those two groups of people do essentially exactly the same thing. And they're so similar that those, the, 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 the behavioral neurology and uh, neuropsychiatry societies meet together. <laughs> and, um, and, and that's because in psychiatry and in medicine, and I mentioned the enormous flexibility that we have, that often people define themselves by what they do, the kind of patients they treat, the kind of approaches they use. And you can use many of these approaches in neurology and in psychiatry. Um, uh, uh, so um, uh, behavioral neuroscience is the broader field of studying aspects of the brain that affect behavior. And that's very relevant to both neurology and to psychiatry. Thank you. And where do you recommend finding research opportunities in neuroscience? So, um, I would start in the places that are close to you, um, where in, in your college, talking, this is the way that I, I'll, I'll just start off by saying, tell you the path that I did, which is I just started, excuse me, talking to people. One of the little tiny pictures on, on my screen was a picture of a psychiatrist uh, at, at my college, a guy by the name of Dan, Danny Friedman. And when I discovered the endorphins, I thought that was the most incredible thing and I had to get involved in it, but I had no idea about how to get involved with it. I didn't even know who to talk to. So I just ma made an appointment with the chair of the Department of Psychiatry. Uh, you might say it was kind of bold of me to do that, but I just asked him, who's, who, who's doing this kind of work? And he was incredibly kind and he directed me to a laboratory that was doing that kind of work. And that's how I got connected. So. I didn't know anything about it. 
my dad didn't know anything about it. I didn't know anything about it, but I found, I just kept asking questions until someone could, could uh, direct me to the right place. Thank you, Dr. Krista. And can you speak more on misunderstood neurology disorders like ADHD and the resources on how to manage these disorders while pursuing a profession? What programs are available for students? So is the question about how to, how to manage their own ADHD, do you think? It would be if you were in the medical profession. And you and had ADHD? Others. Or you wanted to help people who had ADHD? Yeah. So, so there are many ways to, so one of the great things about, about mental health and psychiatry and neuroscience is that there are many paths, many career paths. So I know people who work in ADHD, who are social workers, who are psychologists, who are psychiatric nurses, who are psychiatrists, and who are neurologists. And, um, and they all uh, are brought together because they are, uh, think ADHD is a very important problem. Neurologists and psychiatrists tend to be involved in the clinical assessment and prescribing of medications. Psychologists and social workers may be involved in the school and family problems um, uh, or psychotherapy. Um, uh, there are also now some uh, cognitive uh, training techniques, computer games that you can play to work on, on uh, improving attention. But, but um, you can pursue a variety of different careers and still be involved in either the research or the treatment of ADHD. Okay, thank you. And are you familiar with, or have you done research on the relations of neuroscience and music or the effect that musical rhythms have on neural movement? That's, I think, a really interesting question. And, and particularly interesting because so many people, myself included, find listening to music very soothing and relaxing. And um, there are people who are doing research on the neural basis of, uh, of uh, music appreciation and the way that uh, music helps people to relax. So, so there are people who do that. I don't happen to do that, but I, I think that work is interesting. And when diagnosing patients, how often are they misdiagnosed or have multiple disorders? What disorders show the most comorbidity? That is a very sophisticated question. So this is one of the, one of the things that I didn't talk about is the complexity of psychiatric diagnoses. And one of the sources of complexity is that so far, psychiatric diagnoses are made on the basis of reported symptoms and difficulties. In other words, if you uh, use opiates, you have opiate use disorder. If you are depressed, you have major depression. If you have, um, um, uh, hear voices and uh, have uh, difficulty focusing at work, you may be diagnosed with schizophrenia. So um, we don't think the brain works in such discrete ways like that. And so our, our uh, diagnostic manual uh, often doesn't fit the real world. And one of the reasons it doesn't fit is precisely the issue that oftentimes people will have multiple problems at the same time. So they may, uh, for example, they may have post-traumatic stress disorder, something terrible that they witnessed in their life. And along with their post-traumatic stress disorder, they may become depressed. Now, is that depression a separate disorder or is that depression part of their post-traumatic stress disorder? That's a really complicated question. But there are some clues that depression in the context of post-traumatic stress disorder may be a little bit different biologically than depression in the, without post-traumatic stress disorder. Now that same person who has PTSD and depression may also drink too much. And so they may have PTSD, depression, and alcohol use disorder. Um, that's the real world of, of, complicated, of complications, but it's very important to appreciate the, 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 um, the uh, common comorbidities as we call them, because when I meet someone who has PTSD uh, and, and gets the diagnosis, but doesn't have a drinking problem, 
we talk a little bit about how people with PTSD are at risk for developing problems with alcohol and drugs with the idea that if we can prevent those expected comorbidities that people <clears throat> will be better off than if they develop them and then we treat them. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Christoph. So what is something that you wish you had done differently in your career or life? Yeah, that's really a great question. I mean, there, there are things that I did that made no sense in my career. And, and, and I often tell my trainees that I am the absolute worst role model because so many things that I did uh, made my life harder uh, at, at various early, early points. Uh, and, and so I would say um, that, uh, that um, a lot of what I did is I just jumping into things, sometimes without enough preparation. And nowadays, when you go through if you know you want to have a neuroscience research career and you know you want to be a psychiatrist, now it's much more likely that you might do either uh, a PhD along with your MD, or you might do um, uh, a postdoctoral fellowship on top of your residency training to get deeper research um, uh, background. I didn't do that because I just jumped in and did research um, and I think that made it harder and more stressful. So appreciating how much preparation you need to do research and, and giving yourself the space and the time to get the training, um, I think that is something I would strongly advise uh, nowadays because research has gotten harder, more complex, and you need to know more than when I started out. Yeah. I agree. And what differences have you found between your work in research and your work in patient with patients? Is one more meaningful than the other? That's a, it's very hard for me to say. I mean, I still see patients and I still do research. I can't imagine giving up seeing the patients. I have, I see, I, see, I have some patients that I've treated since 1992. And, uh, and that may be before someone on the call might be born. So um, you know, it, uh, you, you develop uh, the, the relationship in treating patients is really meaningful to me, but I also can't imagine giving up research. Research is the, is the, is probably the thing that most gets me excited uh, when I come into work, um, every day, um, um, and building and building, um, programs that support research activities. Because I think in psychiatry, um, I, I was always very uh, impressed and uh, by the limitations of what we understood and wanting to do something about that seemed also really important. And making little uh, steps of progress like what I showed today, you know, it, 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 uh, it it's all been so exciting. I, 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 I would do it all over again, starting all over from the beginning if I could. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Crystal. So how encouraged is our experimentation in the field of psychiatry? Well, I think it's not, I don't think there's an overall uh, state. I think in academic medical centers, it's very encouraged um, in community clinics uh, that often don't have the infrastructure to support research. It's less common. Uh, so finding the good home for what you want to do, that I do think is an important part of, of getting to where you want to go. And are you optimistic that there will be a larger supply of psychiatrists in the future, given the increased awareness of the importance of mental health? I certainly hope so. We need you. <laughs> <laughs> Please come to psychiatry. <laughs> All right. And did you always want to be a psychiatrist or did you have any other career dreams in the past? Well, when I realized well, when that, I there realized was, that... When, that there was no way I was going to be a professional musician, um, I, I, I thought psychiatry, uh, well, I guess it, it, for me, a critical moment was in medical school. I knew I wanted to do something neuro. And I got a chance to try neurology, which I like a lot, and neurosurgery, which I like being 
connected to, um, but I don't have the temperament of a neurosurgeon. Um, a neurosurgeons have to have, have to be really, really patient and really, really detail oriented because if you, if you go off, if your mind drifts off and you, and you cut out the wrong part of the brain, that's not a good thing, generally speaking. So, so um, I realized that my temperament was good for the kind of research that I like to do. And, um, and I would say that as a general rule, that knowing yourself and, and, and choosing kinds of work that are congenial to the way that you like to work, that's a good, that's a good fit. In other words, doing thing that, things that you actually like to do as opposed to things that you think you ought to like to do, that is an important distinction. Thank you so much, Dr. Crystal. And that brings us back to the lessons that you shared with us earlier. And unfortunately, we have to cut off our Q&A session for now. But thank you, Dr. Crystal, for your time. For the attendees, please stay tuned for Dr. Wynn's presentation on exploring competitive specialties as an underrepresented student. And we will also have a survey. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.